Hi. How are you all? Thanks, thanks for coming out. Um, so, uh, 10 years ago, um, I finished Columbine. That took me 10 years to research and write. And I was like, oh, thank God, that's done. Um, so, and after recovering from the second bout of secondary PTSD, which I had no idea was a thing. I mean, who knew? Um, but it's a horrible thing. Uh, and getting through that, I was just like at a huge sigh of relief that that's done and I can move on to other things and never have to do that again. Um, so, so uh, what the hell is this? Um, I did not foresee this. In fact, I swore I would never do another book um, on anything like this, and I meant it. And not only, uh, you know, after I finished Columbine, that was the third or fourth time that I had, you know, sort of, you know, done that huge sigh of relief. The first one being a month out when I finished a really big piece for Salon.com that I spent a month on. And I was like, thank God, okay, that's done. Um, and every time I meant it. Um, but, I, but I really had no idea. And really, so 20 years ago, um, driving out Highway 6 to the mountains, looking for this school I'd never heard of, Columbine High, this is for the, during the first 45 minutes of the shooting um, in a suburb called Littleton that I had never heard of. Um, I lived in Denver, but you know, I didn't know. Um, uh, I was a transplant, I went to grad school in Boulder and I didn't know these you know, suburban places. So I'm looking for this place and I had no idea that it was like literally driving my life into a completely different direction that was never gonna be the same. And I, I, I what I was in for, um, but also, Sometimes I feel like, you know, my journey is like kind of a metaphor. God. Okay, I just use a, a one cliche per day. So like I just use the first one up. But, um, but really, I, I, I had no, but it really has been. And I had no idea that it was sort of a metaphor from what the country is going through. Um, I mean, I, I, I doubt any of you guys knew, even on the day Columbine happened, as horrible as it was, uh, where we would be 20 years later, that they would keep happening and that they would get worse. And, sorry. Uh, that uh, the Columbine, you know, I hate the scorekeeping the media does, but there's one that I think is really powerful. Columbine is no longer in the top 10. And it's still a seminal one that unfortunately set so many of the rest of them, all the rest of them really in motion, um, but it's gotten that much worse. And it's continuing to get so much worse that, um, well, I can't keep track now how many, you know, like the last two or three years, however long it's been, um, three of the five worst ones have been in the last three to five years, um, including the, uh, I mean, the worst ever, uh, obviously Las Vegas, what are we about two years out or less, I guess. We're not even at the second anniversary in Pulse, I think, uh, which hit me really hard was just a couple days ago, um, the anniversary. Um, so I, I didn't realize what we were in for or what role I would play in it. And I think 17 years in, uh, I did an epilogue of, uh, for Columbine where I went back and there's sort of five parts of the epilogue. And I think, I meant to check this morning, one of them was called, I think, Colliding Orbits. Um, and I talked about, I didn't actually mention this particular one, which I will hear, um, but, uh, that's what I realized. I was drawn into these, these different orbit, this, this strange orbit with all these different people. And actually the, 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 the three of us, it's the most interesting and, and odd to me is uh, Sue Klebold, Connie Sanders, and me. Um, we're all friends, especially like Connie. I, I'm close with Connie and Connie's close with Sue and I'm friendly with uh, Sue. I know her, I, you know, we don't talk all the time. We're not friends, but we're definitely friendly. Um, and so that's, that's the mother of one of the shooters, the daughter of the only adult teacher who died heroically saving kids, Dave Sanders, um, and then the writer who sort of like told their stories and tried to bring it together. Um, and what a weird combination that, that we're all close. I actually introduced the two of them about 16 or 17 years out because um, Sue had told me, uh, God, I mean, basically, she said, you know, I know you talk to these, all these people, and like, if any of them feel the need to talk to me, you know, I can, I'm open. 
And, um, and around the same time, you know, I was talking to Connie and she's like, oh, I'd really like to talk to that woman. Um, partly, especially, Connie really wanted to let her know that it was okay, uh, that she didn't blame her. And, um, and several of the, the parents uh, feel that way, not all of them, um, but really had a, a need to get together. You know, we all have different parts in this. And, and you know, I felt bad about even including myself, to, but Connie is always the one to let me know. It's like, we're in this together. We, we, we came in different ways, and, but it doesn't matter. We all have different roles to play in this. Um, and she also gives me permission to sort of like, uh, well, they all do, really. Uh, I used to feel really guilty about even talking about my PTSD issues because it felt really idiotic and trivial compared to theirs. But um, uh, Kiki Leba, who's also one of the Columbine survivors I know really well, was a teacher who's still there. He was in his first year teaching uh, that day. Uh, if you've read Columbine, he's the one who was being interviewed by uh, Mr. D at his office, what had happened. Um, you know, he likes to say that grief is not a competition. And, um, and we all have different ways it affected us for different reasons. And, um, you know, your body doesn't care and your mind doesn't care. It's like saying like, oh, I don't have, you know, the right to have, you know, diabetes or feel bad about it. Like, well, you know, your body has other ideas. Um, you either you do or you don't. Um, but so that's how I got involved in this and stayed involved in it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I say to Connie that like, well, I'm the only one of us that, you know, has a, did this willingly, chose this and, and can get out anytime I want. And now she kind of laughs. She's sort of like, you're never getting out of this. Um, and I, I, you know, I guess, you know, I have the right, I could if I wanted to, but only if I didn't have a conscience. Because I feel at this point, uh, we all do have a role to play in it. Um, and I didn't really know that what my role would be that, um, until I, I think a, a key change happened, I guess about eight years out, I was invited to a scholarly conference by this group, the Academy of Critical Incidents, uh, that was based out of University of Virginia, now it's out of John Jay College in New York. Um, and now I'm on the board of it, but I had no idea, 12 years ago or so, uh, when they invited me to this conference at Virginia Tech. Um, and I was trying to finish up Columbine, I was at a race then, uh, to get it done for the 10th anniversary and didn't have time for a three-day conference. But it was really compelling too because they were gonna go to Virginia Tech on campus and meet with a lot of the survivors who never talked to press anymore, if ever. Um, and a lot of, uh, about you know, two dozen academics and um, renowned shrinks and, and people who specialize in all sorts of things. And I, you know, I didn't have time for this, but I, I made a decision which I've <clears throat> became a thing since then is like, when really super smart people um, invite you to something, um, go. Uh, you know, even if you don't have time and it doesn't work and there's like other priorities, just like make time for that. And it really was crucial because I got to know, um, you know, some firsthand survivors, you know, who made it through that building from a completely different tragedy and got different perspectives and met people from all different and bonded with, with different people of <clears throat> expertise. And over the years, I've developed this cadre of sources, which is such a powerful thing for a journalist or any kind of writer, um, that I didn't know what was happening until, um, especially after the book came out, but even before that, when these shootings would occur, uh, they would include me on their email chains. And there were, you know, FBI profilers, and especially former FBI profilers, and different re renowned shrinks from around the world who are experts on this stuff. And they would sort of hash out what's going on here. What, what do we know about this? Or what do we think the larger picture? And, um, and they were including me. And, you know, partly for my thoughts, but really to then sort of like be their messenger. Um, and it was never anything formal, but often the discussion would go in different directions and I would ask at first sort of like embarrassing questions or things that I was uh, afraid to ask. But I'd also seen a lot of, I had a lot of perspective and I'd been, I talked to a lot of people. I'd been out in the field so much more than any of them. Um, so I brought some things to the table too, but often we, we had these really powerful conversations that were not happening in the media that, uh, and so then I would sort of bring them to the media. Uh, Mary Ellen O'Toole, who's probably the greatest profiler in the FBI's history, she's now retired. Um, you may see her on CNN or MSNBC now. Um, she's just freaking brilliant. Um, and she, she headed the FBI uh, 
not Columbine proper, uh, their, their report on all school shootings. And she uh, created the Leesburg Summit that's mentioned in Columbine where she brought these experts around the world. And she couldn't talk to me uh, at any point during the book because she was still working for the FBI. But uh, now that she's retired, she does. And, um, and, uh, and she, she's a professor now, but, uh, and she edits a scholarly magazine. But she, you know, she had a piece that she ran by me about, I don't know how it came about, about... Uh, uh, injustice collectors, which is a, is a term they use all the time for a certain time, usually psychopaths, really horrible uh, killers and other uh, people. Um, and I thought it was really fascinating, and I ended up doing a piece for the New Republic for it. I did sort of like the more mainstream version, and then I, you know, did a lot more research and found out something she hadn't. But, you know, when there's, they have these ideas, they sort of percolate, and then, like, I take them out to the world. But what it also does is sort of, like, inform me. So after every one of these events, I've also got the worst job in, in journalism, which is... Um, sort of like the go-to murder guy, uh, the mass murder guy, especially after school shootings, but sometimes after other mass murders, uh, where they call me. You know, I mentioned in the book, um, God, I forget the exact quote, but um, it's in my phone, so I looked it up to use it there. I mean, I found out Parkland happened um, about 30 minutes into it before we knew when he, when he was dead because one of Anderson Cooper's uh, producers that I work with all the time uh, texted me and said, another fucking school shooting. Uh, can you come in tonight? And I live in New York, so, you know, just walk it over there. Um, but so, so that's my thing. And for, for the first several years of this, I kept thinking every time it happened, like, well, I don't know what I'm going to say. What am I going to say this time? What's going to be different? Um, but it turns out there always is something useful and interesting and different to talk about. Um, but it's because behind the scenes, I'm talking to all these sort of experts, people, and developing these different ideas and hashing them out. So that's been my whole role uh, in this over the years, and that's what really set up Parkland. But I also have these rules because, um, because I had the two bouts of, of PTSD, secondary PTSD, which is somebody who doesn't witness um, something directly, but is still very close and gets impacted by it. Um, and, uh, and so one of my rules is I'm not allowed to watch anything on television but, but any survivors or victims. I have to... Uh, I actually hold the remote with my thumb over the trigger button to hit pause or stop uh, or mute, because um, that can do me in. Um, I can do anything on the killers. That doesn't get inside me and hurt me. I thought with Columbine that would really unnerve me, but it didn't. It, it was the victims that, uh, and the survivors that really tear me up. Um, so that's one of the things. And I, I, I can go back to a place a year or two after the scene of a crime. Las Vegas, I kind of pushed it by going with uh, the Academy Group uh, six months after, uh, but never any sooner. So I, it has to be separated in either space or time um, to write about these things. So I was never allowed to go right back to the scene of the crime. And um, until, <laughs> until Parker that I threw that out the window. And the reason was, um, so the night it happened, I did Anderson's show. And then the next morning I did New Day on CNN, their, their morning show. And um, I was surprised I expected to see uh, Chris Cuomo uh, out in the field. So I was really shocked when he was in the studio. That's, he, he's a primetime show now, but that's, uh, um, uh, he, was, he was hosting and, and normally he would go to these events. And so I was shocked to see him in the studio and I asked him about that, why aren't you down there? And it turned out Ellison Camerata, is that how you said her name, uh, was down there. And he said, um, I told him no. He said, you know, they were booking my plane tickets and they had me on the way yesterday. And I said, I'm not going again. I've been to these for, you know, 19 years. There's never any change. We never do anything about it. I, it, you know, it's pointless. I can't stand it. And I said, I'm not doing it anymore. At least I'm not doing this one. And I was like, wow, um, good for you. And I'd been thinking about that and toying with that idea for quite a few years. And I said right there and then like, I, you know, I've been... I've been thinking about that, and I, I, I think this is the time to, this is my last one. I'm going to do a few more of these today, and then that's it. Um, <laughs> the universe has a really fun way of laughing at you. Um, it wasn't even like when I got home. It was on the elevator ride down that that changed. Because they, they have, um, at the CNN Center um, in New York, they have monitors on the elevator, so you can watch the show when you're riding up or down. Um, and on the way down... Um, I was on the same segment with David Hogg. And he was on right after me. 
Um, and so on the elevator down, I saw that first famous speech where he sort of called out adult America that you're probably all familiar with, um, where he said, uh, we are children, you're adults. Now I'm paraphrasing the rest, but basically he said, you have failed us. You have let us down and you need to do something. This has been 19 years, this is ridiculous. We are dying. We weren't even born yet when Columbine happened. You've had a whole generation to solve this so we don't die and you're letting us die. Now I'm totally paraphrasing there, but, um, but that was the gist of what he said. And it was, a, it was about an eight minute interview. I stayed in the elevator. It's, you know, it's from the fifth floor, it's about a you know, 20 second ride. And I just stayed on the elevator and watched that whole thing because I could not believe what I was hearing. First of all, I've been doing this for 19 years and I know what first day trauma survivors sound like. And they don't sound like that. And this was still within 24 hours, and of course he hadn't slept, so it was still the first day for him. And I was like, this is weird. Uh, so I thought he was one in a million and one of a kind. Then I got home, and I just saw a parade of them on television. I'm like, what the hell? So by noon, I was doing a piece for Politico about is this time different, and why is this time different? Um, and then on Saturday, my sometime, I'm a freelancer, but I do a lot of pieces for Vanity Fair. Um, and uh, my editor there called me and said, you know, I know you're not allowed to go down, because he's a good friend of mine, and uh, I know you're not allowed to go down, um, but would you go down? Uh, <laughs> and so I was like, oh God, I was like, maybe. Um, and you know, I, I never tell this part, I didn't put this part in the book. The reason, I'll, the other reason is because, um, the, the, I guess that same day after, shortly after the interview with Chris Cuomo, was a, while I was working on the political piece, uh, Anderson's producer and called me up and said, um, hey, what if I put you on the plane, a plane and you know, you co-hosted the show with Anderson tonight? And I was like, I'm not allowed to, but like, but maybe. And so I decided like, okay, yes, just like, so I won't have to like be there. I could just, you know, on the air for like an hour um, and then I can come back. Um, okay, I'll do that. But I already agreed to shows with other networks in between and I couldn't, couldn't make the flight without sort of, you know, screwing them. And so we decided not to. But because I'd sort of like also already made the mental half step, then when he called, I said, okay. Um, but I knew, but I mean, one of the conditions was um, I'm not going to go to document either murderers or the horror of murder. You know, I, I can never do that again. I don't want to like, and anybody who wants to do write, write a book about that, fine. Um, I'm gonna go down there because it seems like something is different this time. Something is happening, something really powerful um, where this may really be different. So I'm gonna go down there to cover that. Would you like me, you know, would you like me to write about that? He's like, yes, definitely, that's what we want you to do. So I'm like, fuck the murders. It's like, I don't care. And even like the grief and the pain, like, you know, that's, that's happening, but um, that's not what I'm there to do. So that was the other thing. So I was gonna write about like doing something about this. Um, and, uh, and that's what I did do. And I had no idea, I had no intention of doing a book. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I had no intention of doing a book, but I was in search of great characters because they contracted me to do, uh, and this is the first time this ever happened, but, um, oh, <laughs> I was also like uh, four years late, something like that, on my uh, Gay Soldiers book that I've been working on off and on since the year 2000. I've been tracking these two guys since they were captains during the height of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, and I've been following them half their lives. Um, and that book was about three quarters done, um, almost all researched. Um, but it was quite late. Uh, and so I couldn't, you know, do, I, and actually I like just, just created a schedule where I was gonna get it done by the end of the year. And so I agreed with uh, my Vanity Fair editor, hey, I'm gonna go for five weeks. They had just announced the march Sunday morning while we were like working this out, that they were gonna just march on Washington. And I was thinking like, oh, can they really pull that off in five weeks? But I said, okay, that's an ending point. I'll go for five weeks. And the deal was I was gonna write three to five pieces for the web and co-produce a, a mini documentary they were doing on it. Um, and that would be the deal. So one of the first things I was like in search of good characters, which is always crucial to any story. And I don't care if it's like a, Newspaper article or a book or a series or a television show, characters are like, I mean, characters and story are the two main things, at least for me. Um, and it's finding the right people. 
Um, so I was in search of really interesting people, and I knew right away, um, obviously I wanted to do the obvious, the stars that were already stars, Emma Gonzalez, uh, David Hogg, and Cameron Kasky. Um, but I was much more interested in the people who weren't stars, but should be, who were sort of like behind the scenes, playing crucial roles, but we hadn't seen. I, I figured there had to be some people like that. And then also sort of some people on the fringes. Somebody who was part of this and involved, but wasn't central to it in some way, playing some interesting uh, role. I, you know, if I, if I always tell people, like, if I were doing a book on Bruce Springsteen, I would, you know, a roadie would be a thing, or, or maybe the accountant, if, you know, it happened to be some weird relationship or whatever. But somebody who's like, can see it all happening, and is, is, is an eyewitness to everything, but doesn't have the responsibility and has a different perspective than you would think and can see things differently. So somebody like that, whatever it is. Um, so those are the kind of the characters that I kind of always do um, and was, had an eye lookout for, for different pieces. Um, oh, the other thing with Vanity Fair was if it worked out, it would develop, then I would do a longer piece for the magazine too over several months. And that would have a long lead time. So it would have to be, it could be less newsy because it would take you know, wants to do, and so I would need things, stories, and characters with more staying power, and something that, you know, other people hadn't done, uh, which, I, but I always try to do that anyway. Um, in, <laughs> in fact, there's a picture that I kind of hated, because uh, I looked like an idiot, but um, that they used when I did do a piece for the magazine, I mean, I guess maybe this, I never talk about this, but it, maybe style <laughs> does sum up uh, my style, uh, so they use this as my author photo on the contributors page. Um, there's a picture of me at the, uh, the, the launch of their summer uh, tour that they did across America um, in Chicago at the Peace March. And so there was like this, you know, this huge march and event that Jennifer Hudson and Chance the Rapper came and the Parkland kids spoke. Um, there was this huge to do with thousands of people came. Um, and there's a picture of me on the, the media riser uh, with all these cam banks of cameras and all these reporters, you know, facing the stage. And, uh, and, um, and I'm sitting on the side of the riser, looking, <laughs> literally facing in the opposite direction. And with like a notebook like this in my lap, and I'm like scribbling down. Um, because I think that's where the stories are. I'm like, I mean, Jennifer Hudson's great and all, but like, I wasn't gonna like do my piece on her. And like, she sang Amazing Grace, which is really wonderful. And I might include a line of that in the story, but like, I'm not writing about her. Um, I'm writing about the people there and the audience. And I was much more interested in the fact that um, this was, I think, the 10th year of the Peace March um, in Chicago in a really shitty neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Um, which the name just escapes me, but it's St. Sabinus Church. Um, and it's sort of a take back our neighborhood rally that they do, um, it's the first Friday after high school graduation, and then every Friday night where the people in the neighborhood march with the neighborhood to let drug dealers and gangs and so forth know we're taking this back and we're here too. And it's a really powerful thing. It has become a, a huge deal on the south side of Chicago. Um, so, um, and there were maybe 3,000 people there. Um, and I knew this was the biggest they'd ever had, but also it was obviously like, it was about two thirds white people. And, um, and I pretty much assumed that like, you know, they'd never seen more than, you know, one or two or zero white people of these before. Um, and so like, that was my first question of all like the locals who were there, like, how do you feel about all the white people here? Like, um, is, that, is that fantastic? Is that kind of uh, insulting that like, the white kids from Parkland came, and now like, oh, we all care about this, and now they care about this too, um, or what? How do you feel about that? So, I mean, that was one of the big questions, and you know, I had to figure out sort of how to ask it. But you know, the answer, by the way, is that, like, yeah, in some ways, it is a little insulting, uh, but that's okay. We'll we'll take it. I mean, we which. <laughs> You know, I mean, I think is kind of the African American community in America in general on these sorts of things is like, we'll, we'll take what we can get. And if it takes, you know, a telegenic girl like Emma Gonzalez uh, to, bring the, to make the white people care about kids in America getting murdered by guns um, and to bring you to Chicago and to do this, well, and thank God for Emma Gonzalez, you know, and, um, and hopefully maybe you'll come back. Um, but that was a big question for me. And so, like, I mean, so I, those are where the stories are. Anyway, I'm getting way off track from what I wanted to talk about.
Um, so let me, let me, uh, and I want to save time for some questions. So let me just tell you about three of those uh, characters who maybe you haven't heard of. Um, Jackie Corrin, Daniel Duff, and Alex Jones. And um, so the three stars that I knew I wanted to talk about, well, uh, actually, I'm going to jump ahead. One thing I forgot was uh, David Hogg. Something really interesting thing happened um, that first Sunday after Parkland, the day they announced the March for Our Lives, I got a hold of David Hogg, and he put me on speakerphone with the whole group that were at Cameron's house. Um, and we chatted for about 10 or 15 minutes. And so David was the first one I talked to, and he was just this delightful kid. Um, and, you know, if I had to, like, put down a list of adjectives of describing him at the time from that phone conversation, it would be like... Whip smart, intelligent, silly, playful. Um, how many here are familiar with David Hogg? And how many of those, how many of you would sort of like use an adjective like playful or silly to describe David Hogg? Um, me either. So when I finally, when I later met David Hogg in person, those adjectives did not fit. The smart really fit, but I mean, the big things were like angry, uh, just like burning. In fact, I interviewed him 29 days out because it was the day before the one month anniversary school walkouts. Um, and there had already been several profiles written uh, by him. One I think was titled, David Hogg is Angry in giant block letters. Um, and he was, and he told me, um, you know, he told me during the, episode, during the interview, like, I'm just an angry person. And, um, and, and he called himself a nihilist and said, I've always been this way and blah, blah, blah. And I kept thinking, you weren't a month ago when I met you over the phone. You were such a different guy. And he got angrier over I spent an hour with him at his kitchen table, and he got angrier the whole time. And I kept thinking, is talking to me about this making you angrier? Because like, I think it is, and talking to all of us. Um, so luckily, his you know, mom came home. She's a school teacher. Uh, just after, and his dad was there, and I then David left, actually he biked over to, to do the 60 Minutes interview, and I spent the afternoon with them, and once I got to know them, I, you know, I bounced that off, and I said, you know, David told me he's just an angry person, and his mom, Rebecca, who's a character, and just will say whatever comes into her head, um, she's like, she just laughed, she's like, no, he's not angry, he's angry about this, He's been angry for the last month. Yes, this is making him really angry, but he's not an angry kid. That's not who he's been. I was like, that's kind of what I thought. And then I, I, I talked to, and generally I ask the same question of everyone, or perspective that I can get when it's a key question. So I asked the, the question of most of his friends over the next couple of weeks. And when I asked Jackie Corrin, who he'd only met because of this, she's now pretty much running March for Our Lives. Um, you know, I asked her then, you know, what she thought about that. She's like, no, no. And she actually showed me a video of David vamping and looking uh, incredibly silly. Um, and she said, uh, but to be honest, like, I only met that David about a week ago, too. So three weeks into it. And she actually used that phrase. I'm like, I checked it that she met what I thought she did. And she's like, yeah, we, we didn't know each other. We were both kind of outsiders to most of these kids who were mostly Cameron's friends from drama club. And... Um, and David didn't show that side of himself at first. I mean, the other thing that you probably don't know about David is he's really a huge introvert. Um, he's fairly comfortable talking to speeches and being debater and doing this. But he's a quiet, shy person who's trouble opening up to people. So it took him several weeks, and he didn't show that side. Um, so one of the things uh, that I also went into the story with, uh, one of the things I wanted to figure out and tell in my Vanity Fair stories and then the book is... Um, that everybody here knows these kids from TV and from Twitter and knows these personas. And sort of the most important question for me is, is that, is that picture accurate? Is that the real kids? Are we actually seeing the real um, TV or is it manufactured or is it something else? And what I found out is, yes, it's all true, but it's just a slice of the truth. And you'll see this with all the characters if, you're, if you read the book, but particularly with David, it was very obvious that like, the angry David is a real, completely authentic part of David, but it's just one slice of David. And it's not the most, most dominant slice in his life of his personality. Um, so it is true, but this makes that piece come out, and that's the part that you see. And that's true with all of them. Uh, now, the other ones that I want to talk about just really briefly is uh, Jackie Corrin. Um, and I started the book with her. 
Um, and she's sort of the hero of the book. And there's about eight or 10 central characters, but she's sort of like the first among many. And um, she's kind of the implementer. And I'll just give you like the one line or just description on her. Um, Jackie Korn is a, is a petite blonde teenager with fair skin, flowing hair, and a soprano voice that doesn't carry in crowds. But she has a presence. She was the junior class president at the time. Now she's, well, she just graduated, the senior class president um, of a big high school, 3,300 kids, uh, for a reason. She has this, she's this natural sort of implementer and gets things going. And Cameron Caskey, who started the whole thing in his living room, he likes to say, thought of like, in his pajama, in his Star Wars pajama on the toilet, he thought of the never again thing. Um, he's a very silly, playful kid. Um, he realized very early on that like, he, he brought all his drama friends and certain other people together. He had this incredibly creative group. Um, and he realized on Friday, so two days into it, um, he needed a few non-creatives. And um, he had a bunch of actors and collaborators and like, if you have writers, if you know people like that, we will never get anything done. He, you know, we, writers, we, was, we would never put on the show. What he needed was a producer. So he called like the best implementer he knew, the, the class president, he was also a junior, his class president and a friend of his, Jackie Corin, and she's a fr freaking producer. She gets stuff done. And um, later I asked uh, Cameron's mom, uh, her first impression of the kids, she by the way, was, she was on a cruise at Sea in the Caribbean when this happened. Cameron called her and let her know and she said, I heard the word active shooter and then everything else is a fog. Um, but she couldn't get back here right away. So it took till Saturday for her to get, this is all March for Our Lives sprang to life in her living room where she was not present for the first three or four days. So she got back Saturday um, while they were in the midst of it, right before they left to, this, to where Emma was gonna give the, we call BS speech that was gonna make her famous. Um, and I, so I asked um, Natalie, Cameron's mom, like, what were her first impressions of the kids? And she said, two kids set, stood out. Uh, Emma, because she's just magneta, magnetic and was. And, um, and then Jackie was different because like Jackie, she didn't, she didn't literally have a clipboard, but she was like the kid with a clipboard going around like, okay, these are great ideas. Now we gotta pick three of them and we need a schedule and we need plans and we need a budget. We need all these things. She was already making it happen. So. We got all these creative kids and then like, she's like the behind the scenes. Um, when I was talking to her early on, I was like, so you're sort of like the COO of this. And um, she's 17, she never heard of that term. And I'm like, oh, you know, chief operating officer, still never heard of it. Um, but then I explained what it was and she's like, oh yeah, I guess that's what I am. Um, and then, you know, Daniel Duff is just an outsider shoot. Now I really, I'm gonna have almost no time for questions. So I'm gonna give you the one liner on him. Who, he was a freshman who, um, oh, I lost my book part. Well, he's like a, a cute little freshman who I met at the, the first Tallahassee trip. And um, I interviewed the kids first and then I asked them, you know, to spell their names and their year in school and all. And he said, Daniel Duff and freshman. I was like, freshman? Like he just said these like astounding things. Like, yeah, he was 14. He was about to turn 15 a week later. I was like, wow. So like, okay, you might be a really interesting outsider. So he was. And then Alex Jones, who, uh, not Alex Jones, sorry. Uh, Alex, sorry, Alex, really different. Alex King, um, who I thought originally was one of the outsiders, but turned out to be evolved into being one of the central people who should have been a star. He was one of the African-American kids from Chicago. And, Early on, about three weeks out, um, I hadn't heard about this for quite a long time. There was a meeting where several black kids from Chicago flew down uh, to Parkland and met at Emma Gonzalez's house with a bunch of the Mars for Our Lives kids and really changed the nature of the movement into being not just about school shootings, but about all uh, gun violence against kids in America and really the blight in our cities in Chicago, Baltimore, DC, Compton, and so forth, and made that equal sort of partners in this and equal partners with those kids. Um, and Alex was one of the first kids that went down and he described that first meeting. I asked him to describe it and he said, well, you know, we, we drove up and um, to this place and uh, I thought it was a resort. And then the drive, somebody said like, you know, the resident, I'm like, 
wait, she lives here? And I mean, he described it sort of like he was going to like Mar-a-Lago or something. And he said, and we drove up and then, you know, there was this huge window, which is also a door. And my first thought is like, um, can I walk on the grass? And then her mom came like running right down the lawn. And so like, and she hugged us and, and came back up. So like, okay, we followed her. And then when we got inside, my first thought was like, well, are you allowed to wear shoes in here? Um, but then Emma came running around the corner. It was all smokes and howls, smiles and then everything was fine. Um, and I was like, wow, I'm like, oh, I love this kid. And I immediately, my first thought is thinking like, I, I'm totally going to use this, but like, is it okay to like portray this black kid from Chicago who's like never like, kind of afraid to like, you know, like do the wrong thing in the white person's house. Um, and so I talked to him later, but by the time I talked to him, I knew it was okay because like, yeah, like that's, that's my reality. I'd never been to like a rich white person's house or an affluent. Like, you know, I didn't want to be the black thug from Chicago. And like, Alex is just for real. He's exactly what, and, and he, he's fine with that. That's, that's the reality. And that's where these worlds were, were colliding. And I thought that was really interesting. And he became, now he's a central person when they won the International Peace Prize, sorry, that sometimes chokes me up, uh, and they flew to Cape Town for Desmond Tutu uh, to present it to them over Thanksgiving weekend. Um, and, you know, he compared them to some of the great peace movements in history. Um, they took Alex with him because by then he was a key player in this. Um, and yeah, he's a wonderful kid. So, God, I got two or three minutes. So, uh, I got time for maybe two questions. I'll just leave it there. I went a little off. Uh, so, who's got a burning question? Uh, go ahead. Um, have you seen the TED Talk, My Son was a Columbine Shooter? Oh, yeah. Have I seen the TED Talk, My Son was a Columbine Shooter? Yeah. Uh, uh, Sue Klebold, who uh, I urge everyone to re watch it. I wish it were longer. It's, I think they have a limit, like five or ten minutes or something. I could have watched that for an hour. It's, it's brilliant. You should watch that. It's very powerful. Also, read her essay in O Magazine or her book. Uh, who else? Go ahead. Uh, how do you avoid falling into the trap of cessationism uh, without cutting out the humanity? Oh, how do I uh, avoid the sensationalism? You mean in terms of the shooter or the kids? Or? Okay, uh, in terms of the event itself, but especially the shooter. Um, I made a really conscious decision. It was easier this time uh, because I didn't name the shooter. I refused to name him in the book, which by the way, um, and I have like, I toyed with like barely like doing it. I, I, I think there's like a page and a half where I do like a really capsule history or maybe two pages where like his background and then a TikTok of what happened that day, of how he walked into the building and what he did, and that's it in the entire book. So I sort of like wrote him mostly out of it. Um, and that was maybe the, the toughest decision of the book, or the, uh, the one that was hardest at the beginning. I mentioned to my editor, who by the way, if anybody's writers here, aspiring writers, Gail Winston at HarperCollins, at the Harper imprint, which is, uh, she's one of the grand dams of publishing, amazing, if you get a chance, pick her. Um, but it was great working with her. And luckily, I'd gone very far with the Gay Soldiers book with her, so we already had a relationship and a trust. Um, and I'd given her a lot of pages, and we talked, so I knew to trust her. But uh, early on, um, you know, I talked to her, and I told her, I don't think I even want to mention him. Um, and she's like, there were very few things uh, in the book. She's a very good editor, like, working with you and trying not to impose her will. But early on, she said... Okay, you, you want to think about that, because she said, we want you to do the definitive book on Parkland. And there's a killer, you know? He played a big role in this. And like, do you really want to do that? And even not using his name is like, you know, it's like if people are going to cite you or scholarly people, and you, the name's not in there. Um, she's like, just think about that one as you're doing it. So I did, and I, was, I really was torn back and forth about But as I wrote it, it became very, very clear to me. And then when I, to her credit, when I turned to the draft, she's like, oh, totally, yeah, totally get it, yeah, totally makes sense. Um, and I also, I wanted a statement of not naming him. Um, partly because I've been part of this movement for about 17 years ago, I wrote a piece for BuzzFeed about not naming the killers, and I got so much pushback. Uh, from media. In fact, Jeff Greenfield, they had debate me on, on reliable sources on CNN, which was the most frustrating thing because he agreed with me on most things, yet was saying he was disagreeing with me. And was like, no, no, this is a terrible idea. And then agreed with it. And I'm sort of like, you know, cure yourself. But I think the idea was still like, 
we can't, you know, we can't self-censor, we can't blah, blah, blah. They've come around and now it's really the norm. Um, uh, there was just a piece about it uh, in a media watch piece the other day now, like this is pretty much the normal, like you limit the name and the, the showings. Okay, I gotta wrap it up. But, um, but anyway, uh, at the time that was a novel thing, but um, you, when I first wrote this piece and when I, after one of these murders, I was on um, an MSNBC show and brought it up and you know, they said, well, can we really do that? I said, I haven't mentioned his name this show. And like, they were like, really? Like, no, you didn't even notice. And I'd already made a policy for a couple of years. I haven't done it on any of these shows. You didn't even notice. You just call him the shooter, the gunman, the blah, 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 the perpetrator. Anyway, so I also wanted this to be sort of like a statement of like, I can write a freaking book about this and never say the guy's name. And a lot of journalists who interviewed me said, I probably wouldn't have even notice if you didn't say it early on that you were doing that. Uh, so that was one thing. But um, as far as just not making the, the whole larger thing, um, I'm glad you brought that up because th that was one of the most important decisions I made in Columbine. Yeah, I'm wrapping up. Um, is, uh, and I'll tell you the way I thought about it. I decided um, the more I don't have the right word. Some more, the more violent, the more intense, the more horrifying the scene, the quieter my voice needs to be. And just let it speak for itself. And that's really something I learned from my mentor, Lucia Berlin, who should also read, she's like now this amazing phenomenon many years after her death, um, best-selling fiction writer that I, I learned from. But uh, she really taught me that it's, um, it will be louder if I'm quiet and just understated. Uh, in Columbine, the climactic scene is the, is the killer's suicides. And it's disgusting. And I, I, I worked with you know, people who like embalmers and stuff about like how the eyes puckered up when they, when they went back into the killing scene 40 minutes later to commit their own suicides. And I wanted to show you how disgusting it already was in that room and how bodies were already decomposing. And I gave you details of that, but just clinical, very understated. The eyes are puckering and doing this. And, um, but it speaks for itself. And so that was the technique that I used throughout the book. And um, you don't need to make them sensational. And I also like, I, I also thought Columbine was gonna end with the murders in the library and then the suicides. And I realized there's already enough violence in this book. And I just didn't do the murders. I just, you know, referred to the fact and then went right to the suicides because I wanted, I wanted to get you the fact that their suicides were utter failures in their eyes. And that's how they felt about it. That they had completely, the school had not blown up as they intended. The bombs did not work out in the, in the parking lot. And it was an act of desperation. And, and it was disgusting and horrible. And you can see by where they did it that there's all this gore in the library. And the last thing they did before the suicides was shoot out the window, probably suicide by cop, attempting to get killed because they didn't know what to do. Eric walked right through just the blood and gore. And Dylan walked all the way around it because there's only one entrance to the library. So we know where they came and we know which, which windows we choose. Dylan did not want to walk through that horror and went around it. And, um, and it was disgusting. And they died disgusting, miserable failures. So that's what I wanted to convey, but all that just did it by itself. I painted the room and let you just feel that for yourself. And that's what I tried to do throughout. Thank you very much, thanks for coming.